Good morning. Welcome to the first episode of Dispolariza in English, or should I say Depolarized. Um, I have the pleasure of being joined today by Eamon, Dr. Eamon Butler. Mm -hmm. How are you? I'm very well indeed, thank you very much. A uh, quick bio, Eamon Butler is co-founder and director of the Adam Smith Institute, one of the world's leading think tanks, making the case for liberalism, free markets and a free society. He holds degrees in economics and psychology, a PhD in philosophy, and during the course of his career, he's worked with countless companies and governments on matters regarding markets and economic policy, namely right across the ocean in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. He's won the Freedom Medal awarded by Freedoms Foundation at Valley Forge and the UK National Free Enterprise Award. And he's written about 30 books. And uh, it's the first time I use about for the number of books someone has written here. <laughs> Welcome, Eamon, and thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful to be uh, back in Portugal. Yeah. Uh, so what I normally do here, how I normally start is with something called the Social and Genetic Lottery. And because this project is about polarization and I think it's a useful tool to, to keep in mind that no one really chose that much about who they are, right? Because you didn't choose your genes, you didn't choose the family you were born into, you didn't choose like how wealthy or how literate your parents are. And so um, I'd like to ask you a bit about your childhood and uh, your parents and your parents' ideas. And if you think that molded you into the evil neoliberal you are today. <laughs> oh, <laughs> golly, no, I don't think it did. Um, I think that, uh, well, I was, I was born in a small village in rural Shropshire in Eng England, um, and uh, my father ran a filling station um, and repair shop, uh, and my mother did the books uh, and uh, the, all the accounting and sending the bills out and things like that. Um, so I, I did sort of learn a little bit about running a small business and what you need to do to, to run a business. And actually, one of the most interesting lessons of that is that uh, you only succeed in running a, a business if you build up a reputation. Um, you, you don't, you don't uh, succeed in business by making a quick buck. You know, the left are always saying, oh, you are making a quick buck. Uh, no, uh, um, you can make one quick buck, but you won't make two because your customers won't come back again because they don't trust you. and They, they think you're giving them a bad, bad uh, value. So that taught me a, a little bit. They didn't really have any political views themselves. And then um, I went to university in St. Andrews in Scotland. My mother was Scots. Uh, and uh, I sort of like, thought I'd like to go to Scotland. That's where my mother's family came from. Um, so I did that. And at the University of St. Andrews in the early 1970s, there was uh, quite a, a sort of libertarian group. They called themselves the Conservative Association, but they were really uh, libertarians. And so uh, they were trying to inject ideas into the Conservative Party in, in Britain, really. So I think that's really... Um, w where my libertarianism or liberalism started. Uh, and it was a very, very lively group. And uh, many of the members went on to be members of parliament and, uh, and things like that. So it was, a it was a small, very small university. So it was a real hothouse, um, you know, very uh, strong debates. And it was an era when um, the stakes were very high that we were really talking about, are we going to be ending up looking like Russia or looking like America. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so the, stakes were, the stakes were very high. And, uh, and so you've got this uh, very intense debate. So I think that's really where I originated all these things. Who kind of solved that uh, question? Was it Margaret Thatcher? Like whether you would go in the direction of Russia <laughs> or the USA? Well, to a certain extent, yes, that's right. Because we were gradually sort of slipping. That, that is the thing. And uh, 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 as I say, I mean, I mean in uh, 1979, she, she was elected. Um, and uh, in, in 1978, there were basically the unions were, were, were running the country and it was sliding. It's why I and colleagues who founded the, the uh, Adam Smith Institute um, moved to America. I, you know, I joined the brain drain, uh, like so many other people, young people who had graduated. And uh, uh, so many of them went to other countries because uh, they felt that there was no future in the United Kingdom. It was just, it was just sliding downhill because uh, uh, the government was trying to run everything and the, the unions were telling them how to run it. <laughs> and eventually it was going to run out of money. So uh, 
Mrs. Thatcher was the daughter of a shopkeeper and others, you know, uh, 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 scion of a, a, a small business uh, background like me. Uh, and so she knew that you no, know, the books had to balance, and that you you had to do something radical, and, uh, and she did a lot of radical things. So we were lucky; we came back just before she was elected. We came back from America to the UK, and uh, um, so it was a, a sort of open goal. It was a, a government that was very interested in ideas and w was captivated by these ideas of Hayek and freedom, Friedman, and, and so on. So how did you end up in, in the US and what exactly were you doing there? I couldn't find a lot of information about that. Um, well, I, uh, I, as I say, I, jo I joined the brain drain and uh, I and indeed my colleagues knew people who worked um, for uh, the Republican Study Committee, which was uh, a group of Republican congressmen who pooled their uh, staff budget in order to build a think tank, basically. So uh, we had experts on every, and there was about 18 of us, I think, and we had experts on all different subjects. So if an issue came up, the uh, congressperson could uh, go to the, this, this think tank and say, right, you know, what, what should I be saying on this, the law of the sea um, bill or the, you know, farm bill or, or whatever, um, they would, uh, they'd have some expertise, which they wouldn't have if they were just relying on their own staff. Mm. So it, I, it was a very good idea, and it was run by a chap called Ed Fulner, who uh, then went on to to run the Heritage Foundation, um, and my brother, who came back with me to to help start the Adam Smith Institute, eventually went back and and worked for the Heritage and Foundation, became vice president and of that, and so on. So it's a kind of think tanking is a family business. <laughs> <laughs> it's <a> monarchy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Um, so uh, uh, one of the things I thought we could do, which would be, I think, interesting for listeners and viewers is, so you have, you, you co-founded this, uh, this think tank, Adam Smith Institute, all about uh, liberalism and economic uh, free markets and so forth. So I think the easy question, but not easy to answer, is uh, so in your ideal country, how big is the government and exactly what are its competences and what can it do and what should it keep its hands out of? Well, I, d I don't know that I have a, <clears throat> a straight answer to that. I, I, I think that the presumption should be that government should be as small as you can possibly make it. And I think the government does have a role in terms of making sure that certain things are provided, like justice, for example, and uh, defense and policing, so that we are safe, so that we're safe from foreign enemies and uh, domestic uh, enemies, uh, fraud and, uh, and theft and so on. Uh, and, and violence. Uh, so I think, you know, that's the reason why, you know, go back to your John Locke, and that's the reason why governments are, are created uh, to, to help people defend themselves. Whether government needs to actually do all of that stuff is a different thing, or whether it can contract out uh, large parts of it to other people, I don't know. But m in most uh, walks of life, we can make our own decisions. And um, I don't think that we need government to decide our health care or our education or, or where we live. Um, it may have a role in making sure that people can afford all these things. But when governments start providing all of these things, that's really when things go bad. I, I, I always say in, in my country, I mean, we have a national health service. Um, which uh, we like to pretend is the enemy, e e envy of the world, uh, but of course it's very far from that. It's a, a very poor service. Um, and I keep saying to people, look, we don't have a, a national shoe service. If people can't afford shoes, we give them the money so that they can buy shoes. Uh, why shouldn't healthcare be the same? Why shouldn't education be the same? So uh, don't support uh, industries, um, support people. I understand the idea, but of course, if you getting like getting a, a cancer, which is very expensive to treat, is not the same as shoes, right? It's a. I understand what you're trying to say, it's, which is it's, it's a basic necessity for life, and yeah. we we do provide one, not the other. But um, it, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's it's exactly the same. It's if you if you need something, then uh, and you can't afford to pay for it, then that's that's a duty for the government. So let's let's uh, let's tackle this like one bit at a time. So healthcare, do you think there should be only private providers and that the state should give 
uh, either give uh, va- health vouchers or subsidize the private sector? How do you think it should work then? Yes, I think that's generally true. In practical terms, there are some things which are probably uninsurable. I mean, I, th- I think that you should try to, to deliver healthcare through an insurance system. Um, actually, I, I, I think there's sort of th- three parts to health. Um, and, it's, and it's a bit like uh, motor insurance, right? If you get a scratch on your car, you go down to the shop and you buy some spray paint and you fix it. If you run it into a tree, then you make a claim on your insurance. And I think healthcare is a bit the same, that small things I think we should leave to individuals to to deal with themselves. Um, Larger things, uh, diseases that you don't want to get, those are insurable. But then there are a few other things um, like, uh, I don't know, kidney disease or or whatever, which which are very long tail, in other words, an insurer could be paying out for decades on that. Um, and then it's possible, it seems to me, that the state should be the insurer of last resort. And I often think of this, we, we're having debates now about long-term care, um, adult social care, um, elderly people and people with disabilities. Um, and and that, can, you know, that can last for 60 years. Um, very expensive uh, residential care. And so how do you pay for that? Well, it's not really insurable. But if the government said, well, provided that people insure themselves for the first few years, then we'll pick up the rest. Uh, and I think that might be a, a thing. So I'm sorry, I, I, I'm straying from ideology and I'm getting down to practice because you know, that, that's the role of a think tank is to work out what the practicalities of these things are. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are many, many ways of doing it. Uh, but uh, I think all of them um, would work better if, if, if government uh, tried to provide less uh, because then, then you get the benefits of, of competition and choice in these things. It's the same with the shoes that you, you, you get the benefits of, of competition, which keeps prices down and keeps quality up. How would you um, tackle the possibility that if there were only private uh, health providers, they might uh, get in a cartel and define prices which might not be friendly towards either the common citizen or even the government who's paying for some of these things? I don't think that's likely to happen. The, the only way that uh, monopolies uh, occur is when government does something bad. Uh, it's when you have a regulatory system, for example, that makes everybody do things in a certain way. Um, and, uh, and actually, Adam Smith wrote about this. Um, people quote his passage about um, uh, people of the same trade seldom get together, even for merriment and diversion, he says. Uh, but the uh, conversation turns to a conspiracy against the public. But what they forget is that in the next paragraph, and the paragraph after that, he he says, what makes these meetings more likely? And he says, well, if you have regulations that everybody has to obey, then they have to get together and you know, yeah. discuss these regulations and how they work and all the rest of it. If you have a sort of pension system for a, a trade, then then you have to get together and you know everybody has to do things in a certain way. So, so it's actually the government that makes it more likely <laughs> that people will form cartels. Um, and I, I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that argument. It's very, it's very difficult to see any so-called natural monopoly, and it's very difficult to see any cartel that isn't backed up by government action. And you can form a cartel, but if it's if you're living in a free world, then somebody else can come along and and do the job better and cheaper, and they will get the business from you. Uh, and it's only if you've got it's only if you've got friends in government that that can use power in order to stop that uh, that that you would get that kind of collusion. So I'm perfectly sanguine on that as long as government knows what it's doing. But don't you see some phenomenon like um, Amazon and Facebook, which almost have a monopoly and it doesn't seem to have been because of any government intervention. It's just because of sheer power and, and, and money. It's because they produce an absolutely fabulous service. I mean, Amazon is an incredible company. And Jeff Bezos, of course, went through many transitions to try to get it right. And he, you know, he started off doing financial services and then, then it was a, a, a bookshop and then it, it lost huge amounts of money. 
and uh, he stuck with it and got the model right and 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 now it, it's a world beater and uh uh fine anybody else can do the same probably in a different way There's, you know the technology moves on in 10 years time there may be some completely different technology and poor old jeff bezos will be poor again i don't know <laughs> well, we'll probably won't be poor maybe he'll have one yes yacht or something yeah like something like that down to his last super yacht <laughs> but um uh so you know i i, I don't worry about uh, things like that if, if, they're, if they're producing a great service then that, then that's absolutely fine but isn't it like a liberal, uh, I imagine, is also um, in favor and worried about uh, the small entrepreneur having the freedom to, to participate in a multiplicity of different businesses. Imagine every single sector had such a behemoth like Amazon that would make it completely impossible to, to start a business in that area. Uh, but this, no, this, this isn't how it happens. What, what happens is that... Uh, Smaller companies look for niches in the in the market. Uh, they don't try to, you know, if I was starting an online sales company of any sort, I wouldn't try to compete directly with Amazon. What I would do is I would look at Amazon's offering and I would say, well, you know, they're brilliant, but there's one little area where they're not very good at delivering something. Mm. I'm going to do that. And then I, I grow that and then... Th you know, I grow my capital, and then I eventually grow my business. And uh, you get uh, bought by Amazon. I might very well get. Well, that'd been very nice. I could just do a, a bob or two from that. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what about education? Do you think education should also be a hundred percent privately? Uh, yes, I, I run. I would close down every education department in the world. I, I don't think it's necessary. I think it, it, it's it's remarkable. Uh, everywhere I go in the world, and I, I go to a few poor poor places, um, the first thing that people provide for themselves, if you know any money that they have, goes on educating their kids. They're at the, that, then it goes on buying a TV, which is also educational, actually, but but. Um, and you, you get uh, uh, private schools in India, and I say private schools, but they're they're really informal schools. Um, and people will pay, you know, a, f a few pennies uh, a day or, or a month in order to have their kids educated there, because the Indian education system is is appalling, and uh, it, it's a very uh, it's a very strong uh, urge in human beings to make sure that, to try to make sure that your kids are going to have a better future than you did. And uh, so I, I, I think we should be growing on that. And I, I think, you know, my ideal education system is one that, that we're sort of trying to get to in the UK and that uh, Sweden has, uh, I think, uh, been, been getting to, which is that you have independent providers. Um, but if it's felt that the state has a role in education, uh, that it's important, for example, that everybody is educated and that they can read and write and, and you know, be effective citizens, um, then basically you do that through a voucher. You give parents a voucher and say, right, take this, and, you, and any school will take that voucher and, and give, give your kid an education. Then you have a diversity of schools. The schools decide you know, they might specialize in arts or science or, or in, uh, I don't know, music or, or whatever. And parents can decide the school that's right for their, their children. Actually, Mrs. Thatcher, um, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of, of this system, which Mrs. Thatcher introduced in, in the UK, of having um, more independence of schools, uh, but having parental choices to which school you send your kid to. Um, because uh, our uh, oldest boy was um, just learning to read, and the the school had um, what's called a real books method, which is that there's a, a, a shelf full of, <coughs> shelf full of books, and the and the kids can choose whichever one and take them home. And, and of course, there's no progression. The kids just choose ones that they like the look of, and uh, so they r read and learn one word, and then they might never see that word again for another six months. Um, so there's no progression, and uh, it, uh, we, we were uh, complaining about it, 
And we used the, the ability to actually move our son from that school to another school, which you couldn't do before Mrs. Thatcher. You had to go to the local school. Um, and it only took, well, we, we did it. And then other parents saying, how do you do that? How, how do you get your kid out of the school and into this one that's got a better reading system? And we told them how to do it. And it took, I think, three of them to leave. And the school then had a crisis meeting <laughs> and completely changed its, its reading methods. <laughs> so, yeah. The so market the, works. The market <laughs> works, you see. You get a better product because people can leave. It's very important that people should be able to leave a service. And that's the problem with government services, that they're monopolies and you can't, uh, you can't get out of them if you've got uh, a state healthcare system uh, and, and no private alternative. You're, you're stuck. All you can do is go abroad, and only the rich people can go abroad. Poor people can't do that. So they're stuck in a, a rotten service. The problem I see with that, uh, that education scheme is that imagine a small village in the interior of North Portugal where there's only five children. Mm -hmm. Like who would want to build a school there, and, and how would you get a teacher to go and work there? Uh, well, you know, many of our um, most... Uh, Important thinkers have been educated in just that way, where parents in a, a local village have uh, pooled their resources and, and hired, hired a teacher to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, clearly, uh, in, in many regions, you want to have schools that serve a large uh, area. I mean, I, I have a, um, a home in an island in Scotland, and, and the kids, unfortunately, have to, some of them have to travel 20 miles to, to, the, to the school, and, and it would be silly to have a school in each um, in each village. So I, I, think it, I think that's a practical problem. I don't think it's an ideological problem. It's just, you know, what's going to work best? But think tanks, as you said, like to solve practi practical problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, that's true. Uh, but I, I think, again, you, you know, I think the, the market will, will solve those sorts of things. And it's interesting that um, in uh, Sweden, for example, where they, uh, they did... Um, uh, reform their education system in the early 1990s. Uh, you, there you get schools which um, are really just teachers. And all of the back office functions, like the human resource management and the accounting and all the other things, they're you know, done in a, a warehouse somewhere else. Right. So you don't have to have a huge establishment in your local village in North Portugal um, to to run the school, you just need a couple of teachers. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, it, it's a practical problem. Yeah, and actually, uh, something to, to strengthen your point is technology, because nowadays, you know, just a teacher in a room and a, and a, a laptop, you know, or blackboard is enough. But even and I saw a bit of this when I was traveling in Australia, uh, remote schooling. Because Australia like, has the, some of the most remote places in the world. Yeah. And so long before there was any kind of uh, talk of uh, homeschooling in the rest of the world, they were already putting this into, into practice. And then, then I can imagine like, private uh, education providers being interested in it, right? Because they can just have an, one office and provide the service to the whole country. Well, <clears throat> yes. I mean, I mean, I think people want face-to-face uh, -face teaching. And I think it's actually very important. Uh, but certainly during lockdown, I mean, the private schools in the UK uh, made sure that their pupils had uh, lots of work to do and they were expected to turn up in front of a, a video camera um, at nine o'clock in the morning in their school uniform and <laughs> go through the, the, the agenda. Uh, so uh, our, our government schools were, were very, very bad at doing that. And so a lot of uh, people, you know, the rich folks who send their kids to independent schools, uh, they were fine, but a lot of poorer families, the, you know, the, they really suffered from the COVID lockdowns because the schools uh, had effectively closed, closed down. And that, that is horrible. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. <laughs> the opposite of what I want to see. You know, the rich folks can look after themselves. I'm, I'm interested in markets because I think that's the best way of, of helping the working poor. Mm. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, I, I think technology has a, you know, huge, huge role in these, in these things. And, uh, I, my, my brother is actually a, um, uh, quite an expert on, 
on education. And uh, he says, we're, you know, we're getting to the upside down school day that uh, it used to be that uh, you, the teacher taught you things and then you went back and, and did homework and so on. Um, and of course, you got stuck with homework because you didn't really understand it properly. And so it was a, a mess. And he says, now, actually, it's, it's the other, other way around that um, at home, you get the, the video teaching and then you go to school to do the homework. <laughs> Mm. And when you're stuck, the teacher is there to say, oh, no, it's not that way. It's this way. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of that happened during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, but taking it a step further. So imagine. But, 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 you, need, but you, need, you need choice and variety in education for that to happen at all. It won't happen if it's a state monopoly. There's no reason why they should bother to change anything. So let's take it. Uh, let's make it even more difficult. So let's the same village in the interior of North Portugal. There are like five parents and they have five or 10 children in that village and they're very poor. So they, they absolutely cannot all get together and hire a teacher. So in that case, you think the government should give them a, an education voucher or yes, something I of the sort? Yes, I do. What if they're not poor? Should they not get it? No. Okay. So it would be based on their income, on yeah. an income statement of some yeah. sort. Yeah. Okay, which moves us on to the next part, which is pensions. And this idea I read on, on Adam Smith's website, not Adam Smith himself, Adam <laughs> Smith Institute's website, which is a negative income tax. Mm -hmm. um, are you a proponent of this idea for, for the UK, for instance? Uh, yes, I mean, no idea is perfect. Uh, okay. but, but maybe, I, maybe explain it first. Well, it's quite simple. Uh, if you're above a certain line, you pay tax. And the higher you are above that line, the more tax you pay. So our suggestion, this goes back, it's an idea that Milton Friedman uh, floated in the 60s, I guess, um, is that below that line, um, uh, above the line you pay tax, below, below the line you get money so that nobody falls b below a certain line. So uh, employers pay uh, what is the rate for the job, but if that isn't enough to live on, then the state will make up your, your income, and it's called a negative income tax. Um, and it seems to me to be a much more efficient way of helping poor people than the, the welfare system that we've got at the moment, which has all sorts of different benefits with all sorts of different rules and is extremely complicated and bureaucratic to, to manage. I mean, we, we in the UK, I don't know what our welfare budget is. It's maybe 10% of GDP, and yet we've still got poverty. We've been, you know, we've been throwing billions at this for uh, decades since 19, the 1940s. <laughs> we should have eliminated poverty by now on that rate. Um, and I, I, I think, uh, you know, basically, if people are poor, give them money or give them a voucher. Hmm. So imagine I employ a clean, imagine that that threshold is at a thousand pounds a month, let's say, mm -hmm. and I, empl I employ someone and I pay them 300 mm -hmm. pounds a month because that's what the market is giving for that particular job. Yeah. Um, isn't that also a way of, let's say, putting in the government's hand um, something which maybe should have been provided by the company? So wouldn't that create kind of the perverse incentive of, okay, I can employ people for as low as I yeah. possibly can because I know the government will pay the rest? Yeah, there's a little bit of that, mm -hmm. yeah, un un unquestionably. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a lot uh, better and easier than what we've got at the moment because there's a huge bureaucratic cost on, not only on the taxpayer, but also on on companies at the moment. So, um, yes, yeah, you know, I think you're. I think you're probably right. At, at the same time, uh, I, you know, I think people want to earn their own living. They don't really want to live on the state, and you, your cleaner would prefer uh, to be doing a job and getting a good rate of pay rather than getting subsidised by the government. I'm pretty sure that that's right for most people. Yeah, and. Like comparing here to Portugal, a lot of, not a lot of people, but a, a fringe of the society make a lot of noise about um, people who get money for not doing anything like welfare and so on. But I, the other day I was putting myself in that position. I was like, if I was making, let's say 500 euros per month off benefits mm -hmm. and I had the choice to either keep making that amount of money and just uh, be able to read and learn and watch YouTube videos or receive 700 euros, which is the minimum salary here, and work for 50 hours a week plus two hours in buses, I would be the person who would not work. Of course. So I would be the one who would be just uh, choosing consciously 
to live off the government because I think it would be a better life for me, you know? Yeah. So it's hard to point, for me, it's hard to point a finger at those people, you know, and, mm -hmm. and maybe that solution that of the negative income tax, it reduces that, uh, it reduces what people like me mm -hmm. feel because, you know, I can still work. I won't receive less money at the end of the month if I start working. And so I might as well make my life a bit more productive and interesting. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, how do I put this? The, uh, you, you probably shouldn't have the option of simply uh, not working and taking benefits. Um, one of our authors proposed something which was, was called workfare, which is that, um, yeah, we'll give you social benefits, but you do actually have to do something in return for it. You, you can't just laze around all day in your pajamas watching YouTube. Uh, and so, you know, you maybe have to uh, help clean up the parks or, or do something like that. I don't know. Um, and that strikes me as not a bad uh, idea, really. And, you know, when social benefits were introduced in, in the UK in the 1940s, really, the big expansion, that they weren't thought to be something that was permanent that you could live on. It was it was temporary relief for temporary unemployment. You were expected to be in work, and uh, unless you were completely disabled or uh, too elderly to to work or something like that, but uh, otherwise, social benefits uh, were designed uh, to uh, to be a temporary relief. And I think that's probably the the mindset that we that we should have. So there's no, there's no uh, right way of doing this, and there are incentives and, and disincentives. But I think that we really trap people in poverty these days by by having a benefit system which, as you say, induces people not to work or to avoid work. Uh, you know, we have a bizarre rule about how many hours you work and your benefit entitlement, and so uh, you can't get full time employees to to be bar staff, for example. Um, they'll only work 16 hours a week because then they would, if, if they worked more, they would lose mm -hmm. their benefits. And you think, oh, this is, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, there should be a way of aligning, yeah, aligning the incentive of someone who's receiving, receiving benefits so that even if they work, they won't be worse off than they were before. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Abs oh, absolutely. That's right. So kind of on this topic, a lot of people predict that in the space of the next 20 years, uh, about half jobs will disappear because of AI and automation and a lot of other things. Uh, do you see universal basic income as an inevitability or as something horrible which we mu must avoid? Have you guys at this institute been thinking about this? Yes, there's a, there's a big difference between a, a negative income tax, Friedman's idea, and a universal basic income. A universal basic income is the idea that uh, everybody should be paid um, a certain amount of money, enough to live on, and then if they get a job and, and uh, earn more, well, that's, that's really great, but nobody falls below a certain line, the, the government pays out. But that is to treat individuals as if they are basically assets of the state somehow. That, 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 is, that is not treating that is not the state helping people who are in an uh, unfortunate situation. That is the state taking control over people's lives. Uh, and uh, I, I don't like it for that reason. And I don't like it also for the reason that when you work out the cost of this, it is cripplingly expensive. And who pays? Well, the people who are paying taxes pay. So what you're doing is to raise the the benefits, raise the free free money. You give everybody free money, and then you, when they if they start working, then you you're you're charging them more. So you're you're increasing the uh, so 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 their benefit of working is is lower. So again, why shouldn't they stay at home and not do, and not do anything? So universal basic income is is a it's it's a socialist idea which I I I. I think fails on practical and ideological grounds. So if half jo half half the jobs were to disappear, you would just simply apply negative income tax to those people? Well, firstly I think I think uh, your your concept that well 50% of jobs are going to disappear is wrong. <laughs> um, in any decade I'm sure um, a very large proportion of jobs disappear, but then new jobs come along, right? Um, we don't have 
all that many people uh, digging ditches and, and you know using uh, spades and shovels to to build roads anymore. We have mechanical, we have machines to do that, uh, and it's the same with uh, many other. Uh, uh, forms of life and uh, artificial intelligence may indeed uh, take over a number of uh, routine, very boring uh, <laughs> tasks. That's great. That allows us to do other things that are more interesting, uh, and we can, uh, you know, we can run art galleries and, and do things like that instead. So uh, this is this is wonderful news. I mean, <laughs> I want these jobs to disappear <laughs> because they're, they're they're jobs that people don't really want to do. Uh, and I'd, I'd prefer a world in which people are doing uh, things that, that they, they find fulfillment from. Um, so, you know, the world has changed hugely. I mean, just look in the last uh, 100 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have motor transport and uh, air travel and all. These. these are all new. These create new jobs and new opportunities that didn't exist before. Yes. Okay. So you're an AI optimist in the sense that you, you don't think it will create it. A, a huge amount of unemployment. You think there will be always, there will always be new no, jobs? No, I think it's like electricity. It, it, you know, people said electricity always going to kill jobs. No, it doesn't. It creates jobs because there's all sorts of things you can do with electricity. <laughs> the thing about AI is that uh, I think it's such a paradigm shift that no. all the new jobs it will create no. will be better done by AI itself. We had, we had exact look. I'm old enough to remember when computers came in, right? <laughs> and or at least you know uh, business computers, and everybody said, "Oh, well." Firstly, they said we're going to have a paperless office, and that's not true because they created more paper than ever before. Uh, but they also said, "Oh, it's, it's going to put everybody out of work." No, it doesn't. It it allows them to work much more efficiently, um, so and to do things that they couldn't possibly have done before. So it creates new jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's actually think it's a, a different kind of paradigm shift, much bigger than electricity or or any of that, because it's almost like creating a new a new kind of person more intelligent than us, but which doesn't have a, a physical form like we're used to. Well, I, I've been this is uh, this year is Adam Smith's three uh, hundredth anniversary of his birth, and uh, I've been uh, going around doing a lot of talks on on Adam Smith. And so I thought I would ask uh, one of these uh, AI chatbots, whatever they're called, um, you know, uh, what do I think about Adam Smith, you see? And uh, it gave me a few interesting points, and the rest was complete garbage. Uh, so I thought, that's useful. You know, the, 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 a couple of useful insights there, which I'll include in my talk, but <laughs> this bit <laughs> is just a complete nonsense. So I think there are limits to to these things, uh, but as uh, as you know, they they will of course Im improve. But in doing that, I think that, I think that, that that will liberate us. I think that 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 makes us free. If you can if you can get if you can get all of that work that has to be done done by a machine, then it frees you to do the work that you want to do. Okay. Nice to see you're an optimist. <laughs> so, I, I, th I think there are other problems about AI. I mean, I, mean, I think it is, you know, it's a, it is a potential danger. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, I don't want to mention the B word, but after Brexit, uh, you know, our view in the UK on um, artificial intelligence and the development of artificial intelligence is different from that of the, the European Union, which is the European Union is very precautionary. Um, whereas I think we, we'll be much more, we are, being, being much more um, uh, experimental and, and you know, our law allows people to experiment with these things. And it's only when, if there's a, in British law, you can do anything you like, only if there's a problem, then, then the law changes and right. says you can't do that anymore. And in the continent, it's sort of the other way around. You have to have a law saying that you can do it. Um, so, in terms of artificial intelligence, the uh, the European legislation is, I think, uh, restrictive, and that will uh, count against them in the in the long run. And uh, you will you might say, well, that'll be protecting jobs, and I will say, no, it's it won't because it, it means that you you will lose that edge in in the new technologies. Okay, so you're not talking about existential risk in research labs. You're talking about using AI in in the economy. The Euro European Union yeah. is more restrictive. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So let's move on to the hardest part <laughs> for guests, which is uh, this little bit I have, which is people attacking ideas they normally defend. <laughs> and so I'd like to invite you to 
do your best to to point out some of the biggest uh, flaws and disadvantages in in free market capitalism and and liberalism oh it has many what what uh, whenever i'm asked this question like that i'm always uh, anxious to point out that okay we can talk about the reality of capitalism and compare it with the reality of socialism or we can talk about the theory of capitalism and compare it with the theory of socialism what you must never allow is yourself to be trapped into talking about the, the practicality of capitalism against the theory of socialism. Mm -hmm. And I look at this, I look at the practicality of socialism, and it's pretty awful. You know, uh, hundreds of millions of people killed or starved. Uh, and uh, but you were supposed to attack liberalism. Yeah, all right. Well, 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 I, I, I'm just right. I'm, I'm just I'm just setting the ground rules. Right. Okay. Preparing yourself for the trauma. Right. So so what I'm saying is there's an awful lot that's wrong with socialism. Right. There's stuff that's wrong with capitalism as it turns out, uh, as it has turned out uh, too. Um, and uh, yes, you you get cronyism. You get Adam Smith point, pointed this out that uh, business people sidle up to politicians and. Uh, do them favors and they get favors in return and and so you're using the the power of the state to uh, benefit your business and keep out uh, the uh, your your competitors and that kind of thing I, I mean th that is the that is the biggest worry but the uh, the cause of that is is not business people they're acting perfectly rationally uh, the cause of that is that there is power there to be used it's, uh, it's it's not that 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 people will use power. It's that the power exists in the first place, and if the power didn't exist in the first place, and and politicians couldn't uh, push businesses around and and create rules and regulations that keep out uh, competitors, um, then there wouldn't be any point in business people, um, you know, buying lunches for politicians. But even in the tiny state, which is only has military, police, and justice. There would still be an incentive for a businessman who sells weapons to befriend and groom people making decisions on which uh, which uh, provider should we have for our weapons. Well, that's true. Uh, and and if we if we kept it to that, then that that would probably be acceptable. Uh, it's when it goes into every section of your life that's the problem. When it goes into health and education and. Um, every good and service that you buy, and uh, I, I've been to so many meetings, you know, in the in the British Parliament, where there's business people on one side and politicians on another, and the business people say, "Oh, Minister, um, these uh, X Y Z regulations are working really well, but they'd work even better if we just tweaked this little rule here." Hmm. And what they mean is, tweak that rule here, and that'll keep out even more of our competitors, and we'll get even more business, <laughs> right? And and they say, we'll tweak it for you know social reasons or whatever. Uh, so the politicians think they're doing doing good, but in fact they're they're just they're helping these guys uh, get a get a monopoly. Okay, so so keep, so keep that as a, that's the main problem. Keep it, keep crony it capitalism. I I, the, I would say so. What else would you suggest? Inequality. Maybe no, on the contrary, the the most free market countries are the most equal. The the, the most unequal. I've written a book on this. The the most unequal countries are the ones where uh, so much is controlled by either ruling families or by uh, by state organisations that nobody else gets a look in. And as if you're not a member of the party, you don't get a look in. If you're not a member of the family, you don't get a look in. Uh, that's real inequality because there's nothing you can do about it. In a capitalist uh, country, you can start poor and make yourself rich. And that happens happened over and over and over again. Um, and if that's what you want, if if you want if if your paradise is something else, then you can create that paradise for yourself. Uh, whereas in a, a highly regulated uh, socialist uh, e economy, um, there are people in power and there are people who are out of power and it's very difficult to move from one, uh, one group to the next. So what you, previously, you previously said that uh, the businessman trying to access power was perfectly rational, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean it's ethical, right? Correct. So you're assuming that one in a hundred 
will be unethical or a certain percentage will be unethical. No, I'm, well, I'm assuming that they will all do what uh, is best for their business. I'm, I'm not sure that's really true, actually, because most, most business people I know are really interested in uh, creating a good product or a good service, um, r r you know, rather than expanding their business or making a lot of money, actually. Uh, that uh, it, it's remarkable how, I mean, I've seen people who've built up big businesses uh, and sold them, and then they carry on and, and do another one. And you say, well, why don't you just sit at home and put your feet up? Oh, no, no, I, you know, I love mm -hmm. doing this. I love running a business. You see? And uh, so I, I'm not sure that, you know, making money is, is, <laughs> is actually the, the, the biggest purpose of, of many business people. It's doing a good job for customers and, get, and getting the... The feedback from customers who who are who are satisfied is is actually the satisfaction that you get from work, and I is, again this is important to, you know, when when we discuss these things with with the left and they talk about oh business all about money, no it isn't actually most people um, are in employment because they like being there they like their colleagues um, they like working they they like that they like to keep themselves busy they like to be doing something that they think benefits other people they want to produce a good product they they want to have uh, a work life with with engaging colleagues they're, they're not actually there solely for the money <laughs> you mean the the business owners or the, the employees? <laughs> no employees yeah. but i think that's a first world view i think many like many third world countries oh, most sure. people are doing jobs they they hate you know just to get by yeah and that's why you need things like artificial intelligence uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you need capital people people need to build up capital um and and that is the difference between between wealth and poverty that if people are allowed to manage their own affairs they they can they can build up their own wealth and use that to create more wealth and so the last thing you want to do is to uh, is to have huge taxes on capital or, or or restrictions that that stop people from building up capital. Capital allows you to to produce things better and cheaper. That's that's why you have it. You have a you you create a fishing net because it's a lot easier to catch a lot of fish with a net. So you spend time and effort and money creating a fishing net uh, in order to improve your performance. You need more of that. So, uh, you know, cap capital is, capital is a, a really important thing. And, and you know, it's very sad that uh, so many countries in the world um, have uh, quite high taxes on, on capital. Um, no, we need, we need more capital. When you mean tax on capital, you mean capital gains tax or you yes, mean things like inheritance that. tax? Yes, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, inheritance tax is an interesting one because, uh, again, one of, the, one of the basic human instincts is to leave stuff for your children, right? People want to do that, right? This is human nature. And uh, the government should be going with human nature. And I know all the stuff about, oh, yeah, well, that means that, you know, some poor families are going to, going to be, you know, worse off. And, you know, pe people who own rich families, they're going to have a good upbringing, blah, blah, blah. But I, I think that, uh, you know, this is, it's so basic. And also that if you have a high uh, uh, tax on, on inheritance, then people find ways around it. You know, they, they, they give money during their lifetimes rather than wait until they die. Um, and and what happens is that they they invest in things which avoid the tax. They don't invest in things which uh, will benefit themselves and society. <laughs> okay, so it might actually be worse, make things worse. Yes, I believe it does. In terms I, of allocation I, of capital. I believe it does. And I think the same is true with, with, uh, with most capital taxes, that, that people look People act in ways to avoid them. For example, if you have a, a capital gains tax, people will stay in out-of-date investments that aren't actually doing very much, um, rather than cash those in and put their money into some new 
uh, investment, which may be a new business, which is going to create jobs for the future, rather than an old business, which did create jobs in the past, but, but now is, is you know, really past it. So s since we're kind of on the topic of, of regulation, wasn't the 2008 crisis kind of proof that we can't trust markets uh, completely? I think it was proof that we can't trust governments at all uh, because uh, the 2000, the financial crisis was really caused by, well, it started in the United States with uh, regulation on banking. And the, I mean, actually you can trace it right back to 1973, I think, when I think Jimmy Carter was in power. And the, the, the banks in America... Uh, lent money for housing and what they would do is that there'd be certain parts of the city where they would basically say look everybody in that area of the city is <clears throat> you know they're poor they're on welfare they're not going to repay so we, so it's called redlining and you put a red line around an area and you just say we're not going to lend money there uh, and that that's wrong because you know people are individuals and you should look at the individual case but anyway it's wrong and and it was outlawed uh, and then under Clinton, that was uh, that was tightened up again, and basically the banks were being told by the regulators that uh, unless you lent money to these uh, areas and so on, and to people that uh, th the bank might not think of a very good risks, unless unless you unless you did lend money, then there would be regulatory consequences that you, that you would you would have yourself fined or we we tighten up in some other way. So it was using the power of the state to make the banks make financial decisions that they wouldn't normally make. But the lies came from inside, right? The, the giving giving triple A credit ratings to the to the credits of these people from these worse off areas. That lie didn't come from the government; it came from within the banks and the credit rating companies. Well, the credit rating companies is another uh, case, and we have the same same in the United Kingdom, which is that the government puts such onerous rules on the accounting for businesses that there's very few firms that are big enough to, to do that. And so those firms, as you say, they hunt as a cartel. Uh, and uh, so they've all got the same system and they, and they, they, they give people AAA ratings because if they didn't, then they, those companies might go to, go to another uh, of these very small number of, of accounting firms. So it's it's the government regulation which means that, that there isn't actually any proper scrutiny of uh, com company accounts. So it's not very surprising uh, that, that bad things like that happen. So so you know eventually what happened, what happened was that the banks were being forced to lend to people who had no possibility of of repaying if things got tough in any way. Uh, interest rates went up and people found they couldn't afford their houses. Uh, so again, there are there's legislation in America in certain parts of America where you just send back the keys and and that's it. <laughs> you know, you don't have any other liability. Um, and uh, the banks knew this was bad business. They diced it and sliced it and sold it to London, and uh, we got the same infection. So I I really do think that it was it was regulatory failure is 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 what uh, what caused that entire crisis. Okay, but let's turn this into a moral dilemma because, uh, as you know much better than me, the 2008 crisis created a lot of poverty around the world. And when you're when you're poor, you're not free. Am I correct? Like it's one of the worst. Being poor is probably you can be poor and free. Yes, but you're not. You know, you're not free to choose to follow your bliss. In a sense, you know, you're just you're trying to survive. It's, it's not very free life. Uh, you're confusing. <clears throat> you're confusing freedom and power. Um, I uh, I don't have the I don't have the purchasing power to buy a Rolls Royce. I'm free to buy a Rolls Royce if I had the money. I could buy a Rolls Royce. There's no, nobody saying I can't buy a Rolls Royce. Uh, but I don't have the purchasing power to do that. So you know, you know, they're different things. You but, can be, you can be poor, but there's nobody telling you what to do. There's your stomach, which needs to eat. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's a it, form of very strong power coming from within, yeah, but forcing you to. But that's you. 
Yeah, but as you said, human <laughs> nature is very important and we should be aligned oh, yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, well, look, look, I don't want people to live in poverty. <clears throat> Absolutely. That's why I believe in free markets, because I think it's the best way to relieve poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, it's the best way to generate wealth uh, and prosperity. Uh, and not just for a few people at the top. I think that the most free market countries, as I said, uh, are, the, are the most equal. I think, I think that's ob objectively true. And it's certainly the most liberal countries are, are the most equal. Uh, that, that, is, that is definitely true. I mean, I think that... Um, Which is, countries, for instance? It's the liberal mind. Um, Which countries? Well... Uh, America is much is much more free and equal than Russia, and I think the UK is, and I think most of uh, uh, the, the Nordic countries are. I think most most of Europe is, because they are, on on the whole, liberal uh, and free market countries. Not exactly free market, uh -huh. not as free market as I would like, certainly, and not as liberal as I would like, but. Uh, uh, on balance, they're, they're much more so than places like, I don't know, Middle Eastern countries uh, that one, one could think of or uh, uh, certain Asian countries that one could think of. Okay, so we, we detoured. So getting back to the moral dilemma. So let's say you have the, this crisis which created poverty worldwide and a lot of suffering, which maybe could have been avoided by, for instance... Um, I don't know, one in every hundred uh, credit default swap or whatever uh, in investment package with these uh, false AAA ratings, the, some regulator could look into, open it up and see what was inside. Wouldn't something as simple as that avoided the 2008 crisis? Well, that's what regulators are supposed to do. The fact is that they didn't do any of that. So... Maybe more regulation would have. Oh, thanks a bunch. No, look, when, when something isn't working, you stop doing it, right? <laughs> okay. If, you, if you've got regulation that doesn't work, try competition instead. Competition is the best regulator. Uh, let customers choose. Let customers rate things. This, this is, you know, one of the wonders of the, the internet is, you know, your Airbnb and Uber and all, all, the, all these other things. You can rate the service that you're given. So you don't need a regulator. You don't need a government official to be looking through every Uber trip to see whether it was good quality or not. Uh, customers will do that for you. Uh, and in, in banking, well, firstly, in banking, I think we've had in Britain one new high street bank created since about 1830, you know, since just after the, the war with Napoleon, uh, because banking regulation is so onerous that it's very difficult to start a new bank, which means you don't get any competition. So the number of banks has been shrinking. People have less choice. Not surprising, uh, because there's no choice and no competition. The banks get very lazy, uh, and they, 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 they do, do bad stuff. So what you actually need is much more competition. And, and I think that uh, with small banks, I would say you have very much lower uh, regulatory conditions on those than you do on the big banks. If a big bank fails, then you're right. Yes, it creates lots and lots of problems. So that should be more tightly regulated. Uh, the, the rules for its capital, its capital requirements, for example, should be tighter than they should for a small bank. So that would encourage more competition to come in. Uh, and then, as I say, competition is the best regulator. That would keep the banks in much better order. Um, and we've gone since 2008 entirely the the other way that we've we've shrunk the banking system into just a few few, few firms it's very yeah, dangerous I, I very understand, dangerous yes i understand the argument but uh, let's let's uh, let's look a, a parallel so let's say there's a, a supermarket which is selling a product and it's lying about the ingredients and there's an ingredient inside which kills people and you could have a hundred supermarkets and a super healthy you know super healthy market of supermarkets competing with each other but the fact that you let one lie and, uh, and let's say that the ingredients weren't regulated, maybe end, made it made a hundred people end up dead. So do you know what I mean? Like the fact that there's competition doesn't make the lie um, softer or, or in any way less damaging to society. No, I, th I, think, that is, I think that is different. I mean, if, you know, if you're selling poison, 
and saying it's not poison, that's that's a different thing. Uh, that, you know, that, that is violating people's rights, and, and therefore, yes, absolutely, there's a, a, a very good reason why government has a, a duty to make sure that you're not violating people. That, that is an act of violence against people. But if you if you add up all the suffering and poverty caused by the credit rating companies lying, isn't it more than poison? Yeah, but what I'm saying is that the, cre the credit rate rating agencies were um, they were lying. They right, were outright lying. Well, let's say they were very bad at their job because uh, they're overregulated by the government. Be because the whole system is regulated by the government, uh, people have to do things in a certain way. Uh, so you get uh, big growth of a, f a few companies rather than lots and lots of companies and proper competition. It's uh, look, it's hard for me to blame it on the government. No, no, <laughs> I'm afraid that it, it, it's it's the entire reason why this that, that crisis happened, and it's 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 shocking. The narrative, as as you know, is is the other way around. Oh, yeah, it's greedy banks, blah blah. Well. What do you mean greedy banks? I mean, did banks suddenly in 2008 say, well, we've always been greedy, but let's get really, really greedy, you know, or something like that? You know, no. Uh, what happened was a, it was a regulatory, a system, a systematic uh, number of regulatory faults that eventually built up and, and created that crisis. There's no question about that. Let's move on to one of the the patron's questions. Manuel Matz Chalgueiro uh, asks the following. A worker negotiating his salary with his employer is, uh, is a normal and desirable market force, right? Mm -hmm. So he's just negotiating his salary with his employer. Mm -hmm. If he gets together with two or three more colleagues and they negotiate collectively, isn't, is that not also a valid and desirable market force? So in other words, unions, aren't they just another way of, um, of freedom? Uh, yes, in a free world, there's no reason why you should not combine with other people to do that. Uh, I think that the, the, the issue is, um, how, how far that, that power can, can go. If, if people can leave a company and find work somewhere else, uh, then, you know, that is actually, a, a an even more powerful uh, pressure on on employers. You know, for example, pe people have um, and people in the UK have cleaners who who come in and clean their houses. You know, one day a week or something like that. Um, the wage rates of those individuals have actually risen faster than the wage rates of unionized industries because because they can go somewhere else and they can say to a householder um well i don't think you're paying me enough um i'm sorry i'm i'm not coming in next week uh and that that you know that, that's a powerful pressure the if people are able to leave a business and go somewhere else then that's fine the the, the height of the most damaging uh sort of union power was when there was state monopolies everywhere and there's absolutely no other employer around that you can go to and that is why we in the 1960s and 70s in in the uk got into such such a mess uh that the unions had uh enormous power power to cripple the country because uh, things like electricity and coal that fueled electricity all of these things were national monopolies and uh, and therefore you got you got monopoly unions as well, um, and the only people who didn't get a say um, in uh, in wage rate discussions were the taxpayers <laughs> who actually paid the wages. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, again, you know, competition is the best regulator. Um, a, a good employer doesn't need a union because a good employer will be listening to to employees and will know yeah they can leave and and, and do something else. So. Uh, you know, I know a number of, uh, of firms where they say we're a non-union firm. It's not that we stop unions from happening. We just we don't we don't need them, and they you know we because we talk to our employees and we're a good employer. And I think that's that's a good model. So you think in a country where there's a lot of employment opportunity, unions simply don't have a reason to to prop up so much? Uh, well, yes, less, much less. That's right. It's, it's when you have lots of. Uh, 
lots of monopolies that are basically government monopolies that, that, that is the problem because then people can't move anywhere else. I saw a, a video the other day of uh, Rishi Sunak uh, announcing CBDCs and it, it seemed like he was uh, on a TV shop, like we call here. It's a quite strange video. It's like he was trying to sell it to the idea to children. And what do you think about CBDCs? Because for me, it's quite scary, this idea that, that the government will be able to know everywhere your money went and uh, every, absolutely everything you do with it. I don't think the government should have a monopoly on money at all, actually. I think uh, people should use whatever currency they feel is right. And I think uh, the government is actually extremely bad at managing uh, currencies. This is why we've had high inflation in, in recent years. Um, uh, you know, some years ago, like in the 70s, we had huge inflation. Um, so we learned a little bit from that. but. But government is still very bad at uh, running money, which is why people use um, uh, cryptocurrencies and why people invest in gold. <laughs> that was actually my follow-up question. How do you, as a, as a liberal, see, see cryptocurrency? Is it a, a, a brave new world? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the wild, uh, wild west at the moment. Uh, they're mostly um, speculative vehicles at the moment. Uh, they're not really much good for everyday transactions. And I think, you know, eventually somebody may come through with something which is okay for everyday transactions and that isn't likely to be a speculative, you know, to, its value doesn't depend on speculation quite so much. Um, but I don't see that that has really happened yet. So uh, watch watch this space. But but what you certainly don't want is central banks trying to do this uh, mm -hmm. be because they will mess it up. And so you're opposed to CBDC in general? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about this news I saw the other day that in Oxford they were going to limit places you could go with your car? Like you could only go three days a month outside your 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 zone. Did you did you read about that? Yes, it's an absolutely outrageous idea. I it's, was I was shocked. I'm shocked. Honest. Yes, I think we're all shocked. Actually, the um, the the idea is it's it's called the 15 minute minute city. That you know you you should have all everything you need in a city within a 15 minute walk. And that's you know like it's completely a complete misun misunderstanding of what it, how a city works. So the idea is you have this fifteen minute city, and we'll we'll create that by stopping people from taking their cars to another part of part of town, basically. Um, so everything will get more local. Isn't that wonderful? Well, uh, you know it sounds great, but um, the whole point of living in a city is that you do get specialist services that aren't local necessarily. They might be the other side of town. Um, and uh, uh, if you live in a village in northern Portugal, <laughs> uh, you uh, there's a, a limited range of goods and services that, that, that are available. If you live in a city, uh, well, the whole world is, is available to you. Um, but not if you can't actually get there. You know, um, if, if, you're, if you can't take your car to another part of town, you can't access that service or that uh, that, that good. Um, you might not be fit enough to walk. It may be that the bus service is not particularly convenient or good. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a it was a, a remarkable uh, imposition on on people's freedom. But where did the, where did the like wh wh what's the good intention behind it? Is it uh, environmental or yes, yes. The the the, the good in, well the good intention is to well firstly cut down car travel uh, within cities, but secondly to uh, to create this sort of uh, <sighs> this kind of. Uh, Paradise. What, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, of a you know a local uh, a local city that everything is within walking range, hmm. so you don't need cars and uh, there's, there's public transport, and you, but you don't need cars and everything is is there locally. Uh, but it's, it's a complete fantasy. Uh, it, and it's, it's not it's, the way the world works. It's so easy to find use cases where it makes no sense. Like imagine you have. Two very small babies, which exactly. is a nuisance to take on the bus. Yeah, exactly. And you like to go to the cinema with them or something. Yeah, like it's it's so easy. I I, I was 
It was very strange to read that piece of news. <laughs> well, there you are. Is it is it a is it a government thing or is it a local? Thing? Uh, it's local. Yeah, it's local. Okay. Although one or two other uh, towns have have been thinking about the same sort of thing. Um, no, I I think if you want to cut down car use or congestion in towns, then then you you put a price on on using the vehicle. You know, you have road pricing. Um, and uh, that's reasonable because uh, roads are a scarce resource, uh, particularly uh, early morning and late at night, where people are traveling to and from work. And so it's not unreasonable to have a, um, uh, a congestion charge uh, on vehicles during those times. Uh, I live in the city of Cambridge, and uh, they're proposing to have a congestion charge all day. Um, uh, in order to uh, fund a, a better uh, public transport system, and of course, it's not it's not a, not a congestion charge at all. It's 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 a tax on <laughs> owning and using a vehicle, uh, because uh, yes, there is congestion in Cambridge at uh, eight in the morning uh, and at four four in the afternoon, and it, it can take you quite a long time to get through the city, uh, but in the rest of the day. The streets are empty, so you know this is a tax, and we should call it a tax, not a congestion charge. But but in principle, yes, I I, I think I'm in favour of uh, charging people for the the road space that they actually use. So, uh, final question: What would you say? This is more of a cultural question, actually. Uh, what would you say are the main differences between a conservative, or maybe the word conservative, and a liberal in the UK? I think it's all about process. I think that um, both support a process where um, we learn by trial and error, or trial and success really would be, would be better, that people should be free to do things um, uh, and, and learn from uh, their mistakes, but also learn from, from their successes. You do something that works, and then if it works, you can do more of it. And if it doesn't work, you stop doing it and do something that does work. Uh, and that's how you grow and you make progress. So I think both um, are uh, uh, take take that line. I think that conservatives um, are, if you like, more suspicious of of change. It's as simple as that. That 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 they think this should not happen unless there's. Oops. No worries. This should not happen unless there's, um, it, you know, real testing and and all of that kind of thing. I mean, there is a branch of conservatism that also, uh, you know, believes that uh, your moral life should should be um, should be regulated as well, which which liberals would not do. I mean, the liberals would would say that you, you, your lifestyle is up to you. And uh, are you religious? Not at all. Were your parents religious? No, uh, I don't think they really went to church regularly, but uh, they, mm -hmm. they went to church occasionally, but ev everybody did in the 1950s. <laughs> what about the royal family? Do you think that's uh, something which gives you more freedom, less freedom? Are you opposed to their existence? Um, it's an institution which can work very well. I don't think it actually worked all that well under the last monarch. Um, because the idea of uh, the monarchy in the UK, it's a constitutional monarchy, and um, so there are very strict limits on, on uh, what, a, what a monarch can do, and uh, that's been true really since, well, it was true in Anglo-Saxon times, and then when we had the Norm Norman invasion in 1066, that all went out, and we had this uh, sort of authoritarian monarchy, which lasted a long time. Um, and until the glorious revolution in 17 something or other and uh, uh, and then we we imported a monarch basically and and parliament put some rules on well you can be king but uh, you know the, here's the rules uh, and that's actually quite a quite a good system and the uh, the point about the system is that it's not the power that the the monarch has but it's the power that the monarch takes away from other people so the monarch in the UK is head of the army, um, head of the judiciary, um, and head, head of lots of other things, um, which means that if you have a politician who basically wants to uh, take over the judiciary, 
you've got a monarch there who, in theory at least, can prevent that from happening. And I, I, I think it's, uh, for me, it was when Juan Carlos came back in, in Spain and there was a military coup and uh, he ordered the troops back to barracks and they went back to barracks because he's the head of the army. <laughs> so they took it through the orders. And yeah. I thought, yeah, that's, that's how a monarchy should work. You know, it, it, it should be a long stop against tyranny. Um, I, I'm not sure the last queen in the UK really got that, uh, but I think that the present king does. Okay, so you, you have you have uh, you, you see Charles in uh, as a potentially better monarch in that sense than it, Elizabeth II. Yes, I think he's he's got uh, he's got a, a keen awareness of of what the monarchy is there to do. Okay. So stealing a joke of yours, um, I never, I never talk in in public longer than I can make love in private, <laughs> and we're about an hour and so in. So this is this is it. Thank you so much for for being on Spuleriza, and uh, yeah, I hope you hope you enjoyed your time here in Portugal and you have a safe journey back home. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yep. Is it? Is that all right? Yeah, it was very interesting. Thank oh, you. Okay.